Angela. I'm a co-founder of Be Wastewise, and we're going to have a panel conversation here today on um, plastic pollution and mitigating the garbage patches. And I want to thank uh, Daniela Russo, who will hopefully be joining us uh, very soon to moderate the rest of this panel, and her organization, the Plastic Pollution Coalition, for partnering with us to put together uh, um, the speakers and um, do some thinking around uh, what we wanted to um, have a conversation about today. I want to do a little bit of um, housekeeping before we start. Um, Google Hangout is a new technology, and uh, not without its hiccups. Um, we're having a little bit of a technical glitch uh, getting Daniela on uh, today. But I want to um, ask you to just please be patient with us as we use this new technology to stream a live conversation about um, plastic pollution. If you'd like to comment during the conversation, you can do that using the chat window at the WasteWise, um, which is wastewise.be. Um, or you can use uh, Twitter to follow the conversation. And we are, we are at the WasteWise or use the hashtag WasteWise. And then the full video um, conversation will be available immediately um, following us on YouTube. But we will also be editing some excerpts from the conversation. And those will be available in the next week. Um, I was hoping that Daniela would have the honor of uh, introducing our panelists, but um, I will do that uh, very quickly. And I want to direct you to our website where you'll find full speaker bios, um, links to publications, media, and opportunities to connect with them directly if you want to do so. Um, so I want to introduce our panelists. We have today um, Nick Malos. He's joining us from can you want to say your organization? Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, I'm here with a. Uh, I represent Ocean Conservancy. We're based here in Washington D.C. Excellent. And you are a conservation biologist. Correct. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. We also have um, Bill Francis, and Bill is joining us from uh, beautiful Southern California. <laughs> and Bill is the president of Algalita. Um, do you want to say just a little bit about what Algalita does? Algalita is uh, one of the first organizations that started research on plastic pollution in the ocean about 15 years ago. Our founder, Captain Charles Moore, uh, recently published a book called Plastic Ocean, which uh, talks a little bit about the issues and the problem and some of the things we'll be talking about this morning. We're based in Long Beach, California. Great. Thank you. And last we have uh, Beth Terry joining us. And Beth is an author of Plastic Free and uh, Strives to Live a Plastic Free Life. Hi. Um, yeah, so my book is called Plastic Free, and my website is myplasticfreelife.com. And um, I was actually inspired to start trying to live without plastic after reading an article about Charlie Moore and Algalita and the research that he had done. So I'm just so happy to be on this panel with you guys today. Great. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Um, well, luckily, Daniela sent out questions ahead of time, and so I have a place to, to start with you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with the question um, that she posed to, uh, to Nick. And um, if you would please explain um, plastic pollution and marine debris and why there are two terms and what is the meaning of that. Yeah, um, that's a fantastic question, and I think it's one that, that gets tossed a lot, around a lot and has in many ways created a lot of ambiguity around, around the issue. Um, marine debris is a term that has largely been around for the past three decades, um, you know, starting back in 1986 when Ocean Conservancy started the International Coastal Cleanup, um, as well as NOAA in their work on the issue of marine debris um, in, in the past decades as well. And marine debris really addresses all anthropogenic derived debris and or trash that is in our ocean and washes onto our shores. So um, much of that is plastic and I think over the years we have seen that the majority of marine debris is in fact made of plastic but there are other forms of marine debris out there as well that do pose their own types of threats. Um, you know pressure treated lumber, um, large fishing nets that may not be synthetic in nature and other forms of debris. So, so marine debris certainly has a place um, in, in our vernacular, but I think you know, over the years looking at international coastal cleanup data, certainly the findings of, of Charlie Moore's initial expedition and, and subsequent expeditions in the North Pacific, Gyre, and Gyres around the world, um, we have seen that the majority of items out there 
are, are plastic. And especially when we start looking at the implications of those debris items, um, we, we see that those that pose the greatest threat both to individual marine organisms as well as large scale marine ecosystems are plastic. And particularly as we as we think about the term plastic pollution, I think why it's such a good one is, is it's not just talking about plastic in the ocean. It is talking about the entire life cycle of plastic from when it's first made from individual resin pellets all the way down through all the pathways until it becomes you know, plastic pollution in the ocean. And, and along that entire vector from initial manufacturing to end of life in the ocean if it ends up there, you know, there are myriad ways where, where those plastic items can, can be disrupted for us to address this issue. Um, so I, I do think as our times have evolved, I, I think plastic pollution is certainly becoming the more common term, um, but, but, but that does not mean we should disregard other forms of marine debris as well that are out there and, and do pose their own respective challenges. Great, thank you. Does anyone else want to add to that? Well, it's a complicated issue, and there are an awful lot of different stakeholders who need to be involved in addressing the issues. Uh, plastic in itself is not bad, but plastic pollution is bad, uh, and there are certain uses of plastic that we feel, I feel, we just should not be doing as, as human beings. But uh, when you look at the marine debris issue, if you just focus on that, it's an international issue. No one owns the oceans, but everyone has a part in contributing to their health and well-being. So it's a very, very complicated issue. Right. Yeah. You know, when I think of plastic pollution, I think of plastic in the ocean, but I also think of all the different ways that plastic is toxic and pollutes um, from manufacturing where you know, water is polluted and air is polluted from the chemicals in plastics to um, chemicals that can leach out of the plastics that we use. Um, those are forms of plastic pollution as well. And I know a lot of us are focusing on the ocean, um, but for me it's important to reduce the amount of plastic that we're using in the first place because of all the different types of plastic pollution, not just in the ocean. Excellent. Um, I'll stay with, uh, stay with you, Beth. Um, do you think that one person can really make a difference in the world of plastic pollution? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm trying, but, um, you know, it's, I'm, not just, I'm not just one person. I, my personal actions have an impact on other people, and my actions are magnified by the example that I set for other people, so it's important for me, just because I feel like I'm doing the right thing, to reduce the amount of plastic that I'm using, but it's even more important for me to speak out and to explain to my family and friends when they ask without nagging them. <laughs> and um, and that's, you know, that's the reason that I have a website and a blog and I connect with other organizations and, and other people because it, the problem is bigger than one person, but I think most of us can start with ourselves and it's really important for each of us to look at our own personal plastic footprint and ask ourselves, what am I doing to contribute to this problem? And how can I stop that and start being part of the solution? Great. I'd like to jump on that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to give us a talk a couple of years back, and one of the people in in the audience, and actually they were not in not there um, during the live audience. They saw a rebroadcast, but they were in a position of power. And to make a long story short, they were able to convert a large industrial campus with over 4,000 employees from plastic water bottles to hydration stations. Now, I had no idea. I didn't hear about that for about a year after that occurrence. But one person, in this case, I just happened to give a talk, but one person can impact an awful lot of people in a very positive way if we're giving good information so people can make good decisions. And it doesn't have to only, it doesn't have to be giving a talk. Not everybody is... Um, capable or wants to stand up and speak in front of strangers, but um, you know, just taking your own bag with you to the store, taking your own containers for to bulk bins, bringing your own bottle, all of those actions. If other people see you do it, it becomes part of the norm. And um, oh, I just want to mention there's a really cool new app called Tracks Action. You can find it on Facebook. Well, it's it's only on Facebook so far. 
And it's where people can get rewarded for bringing their own bag or bottle or cup or straw, reusable straw, to um, when when they go out. And I think it's really cool because it, it, it's even getting people who don't necessarily consider themselves to be environmentalists to get involved. Um, and really, it's a, it's about peer pressure. So that's an, that's another way that our individual actions can make a greater difference. Yeah, and, and I'd just like to add one point. Um, you know, I, I think beyond just our individual actions, maybe inspiring others around us, which is absolutely imperative, and, and I think both Bill and Beth touched on it, you know, our individual actions when taken collectively yield very real uh, benefits. Um, but we, we shouldn't forget that we as consumers, each of our decisions that we make in the marketplace send very real messages to retailers and the larger industry. Um, when we make a conscious decision not to buy something because of the way it's packaged or because of the XMS materials used, you know, that is a direct economic signal we send. So it's not just about, you know, the the you know, the feel good or, or the inspiring messages we're sending to others, which are absolutely critical, but there is a very real economic message that we send as well when we make decisions in the marketplace. Great. It looks like we might have had Daniela um, join us. Daniela, are you are you here? Are you on? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite yet. Okay. <laughs> Beth, you had something uh, something else to contribute? Yeah, I want to say that um, we, what, uh, regarding the marketplace, we're not only sending messages to companies that might be producing things that are less than environmentally friendly, mm -hmm. but we're also supporting companies that are trying to make positive Absolutely. change. And a lot of those companies are small businesses, not giant corporations. Mm -hmm. And so the more we can support them with our dollars, the more we can support innovation and people who are thinking a different way. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Bill Francis a question. Um, one of the questions that Daniela had put together is, um, uh, maybe this will start to kind of open up the questions about the, the patches in particular, but how much plastic is there in the ocean really? Like what's, what is out there? What do we know about it? <laughs> well, we don't know as much as we would really like to know. But what we do know is that uh, all of the uh, oceans are interrelated. Uh, they've got these little thoroughfares and roads and highways and interstates that connect them. So when we talk about something that's going on in the North Pacific, for example, we can't forget that there's an interrelationship between that particular part of the, of the uh, planet and the, all the other oceans. Uh, I think Nick touched on there's several different major gyres uh, within the, the uh, world's oceans. So to try to give you a feel for this uh, and put some reality on how much plastic is out there, uh, we have taken almost 700 samples by dragging a trawl behind um, a, a vessel and then filtering the seawater and collecting those samples. Out of those almost 700 samples, and these have been taken from all over the world, uh, the Indian Ocean, the North and South Atlantic, the Sargasso Sea, uh, the Antarctic, South and North Pacific, all of those samples, only three samples were plastic free. Now there are different concentrations. The level of plastic in the ocean varies depending upon all kinds of things, how deep uh, under the surface of the water what are the sea conditions at the time, how much wind is out there, all those things. But we found that the average concentration of plastic is approximately one-tenth of a gram per cubic meter of ocean water. Now that's not very much. And so when you've got that small a concentration, it's really pretty hard to see this. When people talk about the gyres and the garbage patch and being at twice the size of Texas, it's not that there's this huge floating island of plastic or any other marine debris sitting out there as one mass. It's very well dispersed. It has, over time, a lot of things have broken up into smaller and smaller pieces. But the concern is that the plastic is essentially everywhere and it is increasing. The research that we started in 1999 and have continued since then shows a very consistent increase in concentration. 
So we're filling our oceans up with plastic, albeit at a rate that's hard to see with the naked eye, but the impacts are are many and they're, they're serious. We're looking at developing rafts for invasive species to move from one area to another. And who knows how many uh, species of life we will actually lose because of that uh, contamination, that cross-contamination. We are definitely affecting the life and the health of marine species through entanglement, ingestion, and also through the potential of serious toxic materials being transferred to those uh, or to those um, um, life forms. So we've got a big problem that is scattered everywhere and unfortunately it's kind of like smog. It's so small that it's very hard to go out there and find a way to clean it up. So we've got to do something uh, and that's why I appreciate what Beth is doing, what Nick is doing and others. We've got to try to stop it at its source to keep from getting in the ocean in, uh, in the first place. Eventually the ocean will heal but we've got to stop the pollution from getting in there. And as Beth says, it's not just the oceans, it's pervasive uh, throughout land as well. Hey guys, uh, this is Daniela. I finally was able to get in, so uh, thank you for your patience. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Bill, I came in in the right time, just as you were <laughs> making the statement I wanted to pick up on. Uh, but perhaps we can turn over to Beth right now and talk a little bit about what is it that we can do? about uh, plastic pollution in the ocean. What is it that we can do about plastic pollution on land? Well, so we talked a little bit about um, certain steps before you jumped on here. Uh, hi, Danielle. I'm so glad that you, you could make it. <laughs> hi, Beth. Yeah, I just had to stop for coffee on the way here. Is your uh, video camera on? Don't even ask me what's on and what's off. Uh, <laughs> let's just keep going. I have stories to tell you about Google Hangouts later. So while you're talking, I'll try to fiddle with this. <laughs> OK. OK. Well, um, originally, um, back in 2007, after I read the article that I mentioned before about plastic pollution in the ocean and Charlie Moore and Al Galita, um, I decided to see what it would be like to stop acquiring any new plastic and to live plastic free, meaning I wasn't going to throw away all the plastic that I already had, but I was just going to try not to buy any more. And that was my initial step, was just to reduce the plastic in my own life. Um, originally, I thought that all the plastic that I did end up with should be able to be recycled, but as I've learned more and more about plastic recycling, I've discovered that it's not the, the shouldn't be the number one step or solution to plastic pollution because recycling has its own drawbacks and I think we're probably going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so, so reducing my own personal plastic was the first step but very very quickly I started to realize that it wasn't enough. You know I was reducing my plastic and taking my own bag but I'd go to the grocery store and I'd see everybody taking new plastic bags or I would be religiously bringing my reusable water bottle with me and I'd go out and see people buying bottled water and, and um, going to the coffee place and getting their coffee in plastic, their iced coffee in plastic cups or even paper cups that are lined with plastic. It became a little overwhelming and I realized that we need change on a systemic level. And so I started getting involved with plastic bag campaigns and um, other types of, of actions and start even started my own campaign um, to get rid of filters recycled. And, um, but the point is that I never probably would have gotten in, involved in those bigger actions if I hadn't started with myself and seen how much I could do and realized that we needed to do more. Some people get involved in political actions right away or consumer actions and campaigns. But for me, it was it took starting with myself, doing as much as I possibly could, getting a little overwhelmed and realizing that it wasn't enough and that I had to go further. And so um, I think there are places, there are things that everybody can do, but it's... So Beth, I, I, let, hang, on, Beth yeah. hang on a second, because I want you to talk a lot about this um, in a moment. But let's ask, right here, let's ask Nick, why do we care? 
what does it matter? You know, you're going through all of these efforts, and I'm being the devil's advocate because I, I love asking this question. Yeah. People ask me all the time. You're going through enormous personal effort to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Does it matter? I mean, why do we care? We have like a remote place in the ocean and, you know, some plastic floating around. Uh, most people say I'll never see it. Nick, tell us, why do we care? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Daniela, and it, it is, and often it's the one we get. So what? Why, why does it matter there's a lot out there? Why does it matter there's a lot on the beach? Um, and the reality is there's a lot of reasons. Um, you know, obviously I think the most iconic images to date are the pictures of the entangled whales, the entangled sea turtles, um, of course, Chris Jordan's, you know, powerful images of albatross uh, carcasses with, with bottle caps and other forms of plastics just, you know, littering the gut. Um, and those are all very real threats, and, and, and there is evidence of those types of um, interactions causing real harm to marine wildlife. Um, but, you know, particularly as we, as we move forward, there is increasing evidence that it's not just the plastics themselves from a physical perspective, but the chemical perspective um, as well. You know, plastics have myriad different types of additives to them that pose their own threat in the marine environment by potentially leaching out. But also, plastics, uh, the properties of plastic make them very susceptible to taking on contaminants and other toxins that are in the marine environment. And when fishes, when seabirds and sea turtles and other organisms ingest these small fragmented plastics out there, they're essentially taking a, a concentrated toxic pill that, that contains P PCBs and, and, and flame retardants and all other forms of chemicals that, that are found in the water. Um, and there is strong evidence that shows these chemicals don't just stay on those plastics once they're ingested, but they pass into the blood and into the, the, the tissues of these organisms. And, um, you know, it, it's not just sea turtles and seabirds, it's fishes. It's fishes in the middle depths of the North Pacific. It's fishes in the English Channel. And, and just recently, um, you know, a paper came out that showed fish, uh, commercially viable moonfish in the North Pacific. Um, fish that rarely come up to the, to the surface are, are being found with large quantities of plastics as well. And what that means is these animals that you and I go to the store to purchase, to put on our dinner plates, are ingesting large quantities of plastics. And they're not just directly ingesting plastics, they're ingesting smaller animals that are ingesting plastics. And this biomagnification of, of plastics and those toxic chemicals up the food chain um, are a very real concern. And while we do not yet know that, that we, can, we can trace those chemicals from, from those fishes such as tuna, moonfish, those species that we are eating to our dinner plate, um, it, there is certainly strong evidence out there to suggest that that may in fact be the case. So I, I think uh, Bill alluded to this earlier that you know we don't know all the answers um, and we certainly need better science and we're advocating for very strong aggressive science on the impacts of plastics. But that so, does not mean we don't have enough to act right now. So that, that really brings up a, an excellent question for everybody here. And Nick, perhaps you can take a stab at this if you know the answer, and then I want Bill to answer as well. And uh, it's um, who needs to be involved in the solution? Uh, who in terms of organizations, what kind of organizations? And can you talk a little bit about the uh, Trash Free Seas Alliance? Sure. Um, well, I, I think that the short answer is that Everyone has a role to play. It, plastic is a pervasive issue that, you know, starts at the very top of, of the chemical industry all the way down to us as individual consumers making choices to buy plastic. So all of us have a role that we can play in intervening. Um, certainly we as individuals, as we touched on earlier, through our buying habits can send messages um, to those companies that are maybe doing the wrong things as well as to those companies that are being rewarded for doing the right things. Um, at, at the state and national government level, um, looking at policies that, that you know, address the, the systemic plastic issue and, and make producers responsible for, for the end-of-life impacts in recovering those materials. And then at the industry themselves, changing their manufacturing processes, changing the actual materials they are using so that they're, if at the end of the day, by chance, those potential products enter the, the marine line. Uh, environment, there, there is no possibility for, for there to be negative impacts. And um, I'll pass it over to Bill in a second, but essentially the Trash Free Seas Alliance um, is, a, is an entity that Ocean Conservancy founded a little over a year ago 
that brings together uh, industry members, government members, other nonprofits that are out there to the same table to really address the issue of, of plastic and packaging and try and devise innovative solutions that will actually have a demonstrable impact on the marine environment and our ocean. And, and I should just add, Plastic Pollution Coalition, as well as Algalita, mm -hmm. is represented on this alliance as well. Absolutely. And uh, we very strongly believe that sitting around the table with uh, industry and other NGOs and identifying the plethora of the solutions is essential to how we approach this problem. Neither one of us alone can make a difference. Together, we have a pretty good chance. And uh, Bill, I wanted to turn over to you right now and say, why can't we just clean it up? <laughs> I get asked that question a lot, Daniela. I when know, you... that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, when I get asked that question, I, I, uh, I answer it a couple of different ways, but it's, it would be kind of like sifting the Sahara Desert uh, <laughs> by using a, a kitchen strainer and having one person go out and do that. The oceans are so huge, and unless you've been far out at sea, uh, as Nick has, and, or on an island, uh, a remote island, uh, even like Hawaii, where you've had to travel over those thousands of miles of nothing but water in order to reach land, do you get a perspective for how much water there really is on this planet? Unfortunately, plastic breaks down into very, very small pieces and is carried with, uh, with water and currents and winds throughout the ocean. And so the concentration and the distribution of this is so widespread and so s the particles are so small that to try to clean it up is just not practical. Um, the concentration I mentioned uh, earlier of a tenth of a gram per cubic meter would probably not even be enough for a gold mining operation. <laughs> To, to set up. Uh, and the economics, when you look at the price of gold of, you know, what, $1,000 an ounce, I'm not an investor in gold, I don't know, but a huge number. Well, plastic, you're looking at probably a hundredth of a cent per ounce for recovered plastic. So there's no economic stimulus to do that. Um, I do so support... Bill, I, I have a... Go ahead. Go ahead. I wanted to ask you a, a follow-up question on something you just said there. Go ahead. Finish your sentence. Well, I was going to, uh, I was going to say that if you try to clean it up, the economics just just don't work. So go ahead and ask your question. We'll move forward. So, so here's what I wanted to say. Literally, since the day we started working on addressing plastic pollution and sharing it with the public, good, well-intended people have risen and said, "Let's clean it." And many, many, many have tried. And certainly we don't want to uh, tell people who try, try to do this that it's a bad thing. You know, it's a great intention. But we, and, and we, we share with you the passion for the issue and the desire to solve it. But all of us who work on this feel that it's very difficult to do, or as Bill said, it's not practical. Somebody um, has recently gained a lot of attention with their own solution, and that's Boy and Slat. And we asked Boyan to join us on this call, but he declined because he was busy, understandably so. He's building something really big. Do, do any of you know a little bit more about his solution and what uh, makes it unique? Well, I, I know a little bit about it, um, not a lot. I, I know that um, they are promoting their concept of... Um, skimming the ocean using uh, um, large vessels and basically nets. Um, and they're trying to put a design together that reduces the amount of energy that's required to get those um, distributed and reduce the amount of manpower necessary. So they're trying to look at it from an effectiveness standpoint. I've also had some direct communication with uh, Boy and Slat, and they also see it as a very, very difficult uh, accomplishment. But one of my things that I've encouraged them to do is that if they find some technology that looks like it has a chance of working, is there some way that we can utilize it at the source of plastic pollution, perhaps at a river mouth or even upstream where there's a potential concentrated uh, uh, pollution source? So we want to encourage these types of innovative technologies, but 
we need to try to move upstream as much as we can, protect our watersheds and the, the rest of our uh, environment, and not just try to recover it from the open ocean. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. And I wanted to point out that um, a couple of years ago, the X Prize Foundation announced that they will pursue a prize for ocean degradable plastic. And um, our feeling on this, I think our unified feeling on this is that we shouldn't encourage any solution that perpetuates the notion that the ocean is a place where you can dump your trash or that oh, so. this is something that will continue in the future. Yeah. And again, while we support every desire to get the plastic out of the ocean, we think that perhaps the best way would be starting on a scale that Beth was talking about, personal decisions, personal behavior change, but also behavior change for organizations and businesses and, uh, and uh, large contributors to plastic pollution. And so, Beth, I have a question for you here again. Um, in addition to personal behavior change, uh, why can't we focus on bioplastics? And can you tell us about the current bioplastics and what works and what doesn't? I mean, many people think that this is going to be the answer. What do you think? I think you're on mute, Beth. <laughs> Beth, uh, you might be on mute. Let's ask Nick. There we go. Um, I well, got oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> nope, you were right. I was on mute because um, I got bumped out and then I had to get back in. So um, what I was saying is I think bioplastics have a place, but they're complicated. Um, first of all, there are some bioplastics that are made out of plants, and those are not necessarily biodegradable. And there are also um, plastics made from fossil sources like oil and natural gas that might be biodegradable um, and there are some that just have some kind of mystery additive put in them that supposedly causes them to break down but they probably just break down into smaller and smaller pieces so all the different types of quote bioplastics are very complicated which is why I explain the different kinds in my book um, but I agree with you Daniela when you're talking about single-use disposable items even if these things are biodegradable, they still are requiring huge amounts of materials and energy to produce just for a single use. So from that environmental perspective, I think it's really important to focus on reusable items over bioplastics. But that said, um, there are some bioplastics, one in particular which is called PHA, and I've spoken to um, a Bill at Algalita about it. and. Um, it's the one bioplastic I think that has been shown to actually break down in seawater. It takes a long time, but I think if plastic is going to end up in the ocean, I would rather have plastic that will actually biodegrade. So th this is a conversation that I have with people a lot, which is how do we promote reuse and promote reducing our consumption while at the same time supporting efforts to create bioplastics from plants that will biodegrade and recycling um, systems for the plastics that we do end up with without just encouraging more consumption. I think it's kind of tricky and I would like to hear other people's ideas about that. I, I would ask also Nick as uh, the scientist amongst us here what his thoughts are on bioplastics and the future of bioplastics in particular. Yeah. I think Beth's final point there is very well taken. Um, you know, I, I think if, if we if we look at a future where bioplastics have a have a role, I think it is in that if in fact we can demonstrate that that a, a plastic it can it can wholly break down biologically in in the ocean, not mechanically, in that it's just going to fragment into smaller and smaller pieces at a faster rate. But actually, the chemical components of it dissolve and oxidize into the seawater. Um, I, I still think at that point the bioplastics have a role as a as a safe measure. So if all other mitigation efforts fail and plastics do end up in the ocean then they, they, they will expedite the, the, the threat at which they, they pose to marine life will, will quickly uh, dissipate into the ocean. Um, with that said, there are major barriers ahead. Um, you know, one thing that, that stands in the way is there actually is no current standard 
that says what makes something biodegradable or or a bio or um, a bioplastic. So you know, one person's labeling of a bioplastic may mean something very different, and there's there's no process that demonstrates um, you know an ocean plastic, something that is truly degradable in the ocean. So, you know, from, from a technical standpoint, I think there are barriers that lie ahead. From a sustainability standpoint, you know, bioplastics take up extraordinary amounts of energy for their production. Um, you know, there are externalities associated with them, just like traditional petroleum-based plastics, and there still is oil and other non-renewable resources required to produce those. Um, so there are some challenges ahead, and just from a, a consumer standpoint, you know, I, I, I would echo your concern, Daniela, that, you know, when something is labeled bioplastic or biodegradable or ocean-friendly plastic, um, it, it sends a, a message, whether directly or indirectly, to consumers that, well, if that product ends up on the ground or doesn't quite make it in the trash can, it's not going to pose any harm. And I think everyone on this call here and many people that are probably listening to, to this know that that is not the case. So anything that may perpetuate the, the disposal of plastics into trash cans or, or those that may ultimately end up in the ocean, um, you know, I, I'm very hesitant to endorse. Thank you. That was a really important statement, especially coming from uh, our scientists. And I just wanted to, to give everybody the opportunity here to, to do their closing advice or position for the public. I would just say from the standpoint of the Plastic Pollution Coalition, we believe that the, the way to address this problem has three main components. One of it is personal and organizational behavior change that, that leads towards kind of rethinking what plastic is and challenging all of our current assumptions with regards to plastic. It's neither safe nor cheap nor nor should be easily available and used for um, food grade packaging. The second piece is we need innovation and entrepreneurship and we need real market solutions that will allow us to uh, support our behavior change. And last but not least, um, youth leadership needs to be interwoven in everything we do because these young people who are growing up today, their baseline is different. They grew up on plastic. They don't even see it. So we feel very strongly that we need to work with young people and, and help them understand the real cost of plastic. And um, uh, let's go in the other direction. Let's start with Beth and then Bill and Nick. Your final words to the people who joined us and listened. What do we need to do? First, look at your own plastic consumption and ask yourself, um, how am I contributing to this problem and what simple no, steps... No audio, Beth. I... Um, oh, did I get... Taken? There we go. Keep going. Um, sh should I start over? Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me now? I can't hear anything. Um, do the others hear Um, can you hear me? Sounds like Beth is still on yeah. mute. Okay. No, I'm not Beth, on mute. you might be on mute. No, not on mute. Um, I can hear you, Beth, but I don't know why they can't. Um, hmm. But you are loud and clear to me. So go ahead and we'll just assume that it's going out live with you talking. But, you know, the last time this happened, I tried going out and coming back in again. So let me just try that real quick and see if it works. Okay, do we want to switch to Bill then? Well, so can can you hear me now? Yep. Can the can the rest of you hear me? No. Would you uh, like me to go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. What I hope uh, people who are tuning in hear a little bit of anyway is that we want to convey a message of hope. There are solutions out there. Some are cultural. Some are from policy makers. Some are from each individual making personal choices. Some are from stakeholders getting together and sitting at a table and agreeing to work together to solve these problems. It's not all doom and gloom, but the more we can all encourage people to work on solutions and to believe that we can make a difference, we'll, we'll finally find a way out of this. If we can put a man on the moon and send uh, rovers to Mars, we can solve plastic pollution. 
we just need to keep working on it and dedicate ourselves to it. Thank you, Bill. Beth, can you can you chime in right now? Because I definitely want you to say your thing as well. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, I think it's it's a complicated issue, but each of us today, right now, can start looking at our own personal plastic footprint and asking ourselves, what little change could I make right now, and what changes could I make in the future? Um, when we go to the store, asking ourselves, where did this come from and where is it going to go? And is this something that I'm about to buy? Is this something that's actually going to make me happy? Um, questioning our consumption, but also realizing that this problem is systemic. It's bigger than any one person. Um, it's important for us to look at our own responsibility in this issue, but then step out of ourselves and get involved in community actions um, as well as consumer actions on a bigger level. Um, one of the things that I have on my website is the Show Your Plastic Challenge where people can create, collect their plastic waste for a week or more and then um, upload it and answer questions about it to figure out how much they're actually using. And I think that's a really cool way to start just to see what your personal plastic footprint is. But then also realize that it's not just, um, it's not only your responsibility, it's our, all of our responsibility and how can we be a positive influence for other people. That's awesome. Thank you, Beth. And Nick? Sure. Um, and, and Katrina asked me just to note, um, you know, backtracking a bit, you know, earlier regarding the, the feasibility of an ocean cleanup. And I'll share with you, Daniela, and with Katrina afterwards um, a document that just came out um, out of the University of Washington as a collaborative effort. It's a very short document, but it just kind of outlines the ecological and technological challenges associated with a large-scale cleanup. So um, I, I think that document will be made available after after this um, hangout. Um, but but in terms of you know a final takeaways, you know, Ocean Conservancy for the past 20 years, 27 years has has been running the International Coastal Cleanup and. You know, while the cleanup is an extraordinary effort and we, and we applaud the tremendous volunteer turnout, you know, we have to recognize that cleanups are a starting point and not an end point. Um, you know, the cleanup is the first piece and, and for so long we have been looking from the beach seaward for solutions when in reality the solutions lie from the beach to the trash can and, and even further upstream. So as I noted earlier, you know, we all have a role to play. We need more science, but that doesn't mean we, we should be constrained to take action now. Industry has a very big role to play, and we need to start shifting that burden of proof from you know us as individual consumers to industry to demonstrate that the items they're putting into the marketplace are safe, not only you know through their existing life cycles, but now through the end of life life cycle, and it's ultimately if these end up in the ocean. Um, and to, to point to, to Bill's uh, note that it's not all gloom and doom. I think that's a fantastic takeaway because we need to recognize that you know plastic pollution is not an ocean problem at the end of the day. It's a people problem and that means we all have a role to play. We all can be part of the solution and it can start with each of us today. So um, thank you so much for, for having me participate today. I think it's been a tremendous conversation. And thank you, Nick, and Bill, and Beth, and Katrina for organizing it and WasteWise. Uh, the most important thing, I think, on everybody's mind is that we are in charge of this process. We are the problem, but we're also the solution. And to me, it's not just the public. It's businesses, it's manufacturers, it's the policymakers who need to help address this problem and the, the entire society. And the answer is at our fingertips. It's going to cause a little bit of pain and suffering on everybody's part, but we can make a difference. So thank you all for uh, allowing us the opportunity to share these thoughts with you today and to the organizers. And uh, go plastic free. Mm -hmm. Wanted thank to thank so everybody much. from um, Thanks, the Waste Wise. And um, thank you very much, Daniela. We apologize for the technical mm -hmm. Issues it starting off uh, on time and getting everybody on in, in video mode, but um, I think I do think this is a valuable way to share uh, waste expertise. So thank you all for timing in. Thank everybody who chatted um, in questions and commentary on the um, on the site. Uh, really uh, great uh, conversation that's going on in our chat. Um, so I hope that you all will follow some of the Twitter feed and. Um, 
check back in with us uh, around this panel and then around uh, next week's panel as well. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. -bye. Thank you so much.